Hey, Cassandra, welcome. Um, Hi. Thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for uh, um, inviting me um, to give a talk. Uh, we're all so excited. Um, you're coming to us. Where do you live in Australia? Uh, in Sydney. In Sydney. I, I wish I could be there. Uh, sounds great. Um, yeah. but thank you for joining us. And I'm going to give you the stage to get started. I know everybody's been talking about learning more about you and learning more about the company you work for. So welcome. Um, thank you. Um, yes, I'll, I'll try to um, give an interesting talk, hopefully. Um, yeah, I guess I'll get started. So um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Cassandra Chua. I'm a research fellow working for Silicon Quantum Computing. It's a company that is based at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Denise, Andre, and everyone who made this event possible. I think it's truly a great opportunity to learn from each other and a great way to get to know the community. And, um, you know, listening to the previous speaker, I can definitely draw some parallels um, with experiences and stuff like this. So I think it's really great. Um, I've been asked today to share about my journey into a career in quantum computing and maybe also share some lessons that I've learned from my experiences. Saying this, I'm conscious of the fact that my career has only begun and I've still got a long way ahead of me. Still, I hope that what I'm about to say will be of interest in some way. Um, so I'd like to start by giving a bit of a background um, about myself. <laughs> um, I was born and raised in the Philippines. It's a relatively small country in Southeast Asia. Some facts about it. It's the 13th most populous country in the world, but it's only the 69th largest country by total area. So it does get pretty crowded. Um, after high school, I went to the National University of Singapore to take up undergraduate studies in physics. Um, Singapore is not really visible on the map at this scale, but it's definitely right around there. And um, after graduating, I knew that I wanted to continue with an academic career in physics, so I decided to pursue a master's degree. I was accepted into the Erasmus Mundus master's program on nanoscience and nanotechnology. It's an international master's program that is jointly hosted by several prestigious universities in Europe. And the courses in the program were designed based on the expertise of each member university. So during my time, I chose to do my first year at um, KU Leuven in Belgium, um, and then my second year at TU Delft in the Netherlands. Uh, I think this is an excellent program um, where you get to meet a variety of people from all over the world while also getting a taste of some of the top European universities in your field of interest. Doing the Erasmus program opened many doors for me. Uh, in particular, it gave me the confidence to pursue a PhD. So I applied to do a PhD with various groups at a few universities. I was eventually offered a PhD position at the Semiconductor Physics Group in the Cavendish Laboratory um, in, in Cambridge in the UK where I worked on using graphene devices to redefine the SI units for resistance and current in terms of fundamental constants of nature. Um, after receiving my PhD, I wanted to experience what it was like to work in industry. And at the same time, I also became interested in data science. So I worked at the data science media consultancy firm in London for a year, where part of my job was to extract insights from the data we gathered to help our clients make informed decisions about things like program spending and advertising. But while it was interesting work and it was nice knowing that something I worked on um, helped inform some important business decisions, I eventually realized that I enjoyed doing physics much more. And so I decided to return to academia. So how did my search for a postdoc position make me end up in Australia, where I am now? Well. Um, I wanted to move somewhere near to my family in the Philippines, but I also wanted to move to an English speaking country. Um, and I've he he also heard so much about the beautiful weather and beaches in Australia. And, you know, today we've got beautiful weather right now. And so it really seemed like an obvious choice. Um, so I talked to my PhD supervisor and learned of the Center for Quantum Computing and Communications, or CQC2T for short, which is based in Sydney, Australia. 
Um, I learned more about silicon as a quantum computing platform and the amazing work that was being done here at CQC2T. I simply couldn't pass up on the chance to work in such an exciting field, and so I applied for a position, a position here. Um, I joined Professor Sven Raga's group at CQC2T in 2017 to work on using holes bound to acceptors in silicon as qubits. And a year later, I was asked to join the newly formed company Silicon Quantum Computing, which was founded by Professor Michelle Simmons, along with Professor Sven Raga and a few others. And that brings me to where I am now. Um, I'd like to share a few things I learned from my experiences so far. Um, so it's OK to aim a bit higher. When I was in high school back in the Philippines, I um, never imagined that I would one day get a degree from Cambridge and then eventually work for one of the first quantum computing companies in Australia. Um, it's definitely a bit cliche to say this, but the truth is that sometimes you underestimate your own value and you just never know until you try. I did have to take things step by step. Um, each experience I had allowed me to aim for the next step. Um, this one's a bit of a funny one. Um, it's okay to do a PhD. Um, it's of course a no brainer if you are 100% sure you want an academic career, um, but there's always the doubt of whether you can get a job. Um, when I gave a brief run through of my background just now, I glossed over how hard it was for me to decide on doing a PhD. It may seem like the obvious choice now, but back then there was, there was so, you know, there was the worry that a PhD would be a four-year time investment with uncertain career prospects. In fact, almost everyone around me thought of it that way. What would you do after a PhD in physics? When will you get married? What is a postdoctoral position? Do you even get paid to do that? You know, of course, finishing a PhD is itself a challenge, and I won't elaborate on any details, but... Um, when I eventually got my degree, I realized that a lot of these questions stem from outdated preconceptions. First of all, you don't have to work on what you did during your PhD for the rest of your career. There are many transferable skills you can acquire during that time. And I believe some employers in, in industry have also realized that. At the very least, doing a PhD um, teaches a way of thinking and problem solving that is difficult to acquire in other ways. Uh, moreover, despite all the difficulties and late nights, I met some of my best friends while being a student in Cambridge. While poor work-life balance and burning out as a PhD student are not uncommon, I also had some of my best experiences during that time. I have just one piece of, of advice for anyone unsure about doing a PhD degree. Make sure to read all the terms and conditions before you say yes. What do I mean by that? Well, before joining a group, try to visit and get a lab tour of a, of a few different places, speak to the students at each group, and also check the group's publication records. Um, and next, it's, it's okay to be a bit more confident and assertive. Um, I used to avoid voicing my opinions because I was afraid of being wrong and leaving a bad impression. But what I've learned over the past few years is that being proven wrong is often a good way to learn something new. It's uncomfortable and sometimes embarrassing, but you do learn to move on quite quickly, um, especially in meetings and discussions where you decide what to do next or which direction to take the project. It's much better for the group as a whole to make a decision after debating everyone's ideas, the good and the bad. It's okay to not get what you want. So um, I, have a, I have a confession to make. In the beginning, I wanted to do a PhD in sustainable energy, in particular working on solar cells. Um, suffice to say that I didn't get in any of those programs. And instead, I got into the semiconductor physics group in Cambridge, which is, which is good. Um, in retrospect, that was probably one of the best things to happen to me that I didn't initially want. And because of this failure, I was able to branch off into quantum computing and am able to do the work that I'm doing now. I, I don't know that what I have now is definitely better than what could have been, but things do have a way of working out. 
um, it's okay to do a few different things. Uh, when I decided to take a job in industry to work on data science, I had, of course, fully intended to continue on that career path if, if it was suitable for me. The fact that I started to miss doing physics a year later and decided to return to academia was not at all part of the plan, but I do think that what I did in that year helps me now in my current work, especially the programming skills that I acquired, scraping data for analysis, I also develop more soft skills from interacting and presenting our data analysis to clients. So I, I think it's okay to try a few different things because oftentimes you can find some overlap and this goes back to the transferable skills I was talking about previously with doing a PhD. More importantly, I also learned more about myself and what I really want to do. So there's a, there's a common message here. Um, not every move or decision is final. There's always some flexibility or possibility to change direction later, but it is important to fully commit to the present so that you don't regret anything later. Um, and finally, um, big projects require big teams. This is something that I've come to realize from um, working for a bit in industry and then coming to Sydney for a postdoc. If you want to achieve something big, for example, like building a quantum computer, you really need as much resources, resources as possible, especially human resources to become competitive. I think this is evident here in CQC2T and SQC. We are currently developing key technologies um, to reliably produce quantum integrated processors based in silicon and have already achieved many world firsts, such as the lowest noise silicon devices and the fastest two qubit gate. All these achievements are made possible because of the support, infrastructure and know-how developed by having such a large and diverse group of people working together towards the same goal. Um, and with that, that's all for me today. Um, I hope you found my talk somewhat interesting. And uh, thank you all for listening. Cassandra, that was so wise. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I love so many of the points that you made. Um, I wanted to ask you, and I mean, this is coming from Dan Danica, who always has the best questions in the world. Um, what kind of questions do you recommend um, that PhD students ask when they're picking a program? You were saying visit a couple labs, visit a couple professors. And I mean, that could apply to a postdoc, that could apply to even job hunting. What are the questions that are most important to you? Um, so I think some of the questions that you could ask definitely is, you know, I mean, it's some of them are a bit cliche and maybe a bit obvious, like, you know, what's the day to day like? Um, I think it's very important to actually speak to the students who are um, working there um, and ask them how how they feel about their project and, and how they're getting along um, from a day to day um, and also how do they feel that they're fitting in and working in that lab um, and, and their experiences or feeling about working with other people in the same lab? Because um, I do think that the dynamic in the group is, is actually very important, um, sometimes as important as the infrastructure that you see, um, that you will see if you do a lab tour, you'll see the equipment that they have, um, which is great, but um, it's, it's really also the people. And um, what's it like working at Silicon Quantum? I think Michelle Simmons is my rock star. <laughs> um, it's 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 really amazing. Um, they, I mean, she she managed to um, you know scrape this thing together, and um, you know, with support from from. Well, okay, I mean, it's it's really like a a, a huge combined effort from from um, like a lot of the big players here in Australia. Um, we've got sponsors like, I mean, the government is sponsoring us and a lot of the biggest businesses in, in, in Australia as well. So um, it's truly an uh, amazing experience. Um, it's 
I really feel like we've got a fast track to, to getting a quantum computer working. Um, of course, silicon is a little um, behind schedule, uh, like a little behind compared to say superconducting qubits and, and trapped ions and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I mean, we, we really made it possible to, to fast track things and, and concentrate resources to re really get things done um, in, in this field. That's great. How, can I ask how big you, how big the company is? Uh, I I actually don't know the <laughs> exact number. Um, yeah, I, I think you'll you probably have to get in touch with our um, COO. That's okay. that's okay. Sorry about that. I, I, I do know your COO, but that's okay. Just okay. Uh, trying to create a little bit of a picture. Um, one of the questions is, did your experiences in different industries help you to quickly adapt because and pick up new skills? Do you feel that like adaptability is something that you've kind of, it sounds like you excel at a little bit in making changes and trying new things? Um, I, I definitely think that that's something I've learned to do. Um, I don't know that I started off um, good at adapting, but it, it definitely, my experience has definitely forced me to, to learn to adapt quickly. And, and I would like to think that I am good at it now. Um, yeah. So, um, I guess, yes, <laughs> I, I, I think so. And I, I hope so. Yeah. So I, I, I liked also your comment that to, you know, sometimes it's okay to be wrong. And, uh, I, I really like that. And, uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think all of us want to be right all the time and we're not. Um, and so I love that you kind of said, you know, sometimes you're wrong. Can, can you just talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, um, definitely. Uh, this, this is definitely a lesson that I learned um, a little bit later um, it, because it is such a hard lesson. And, and even if I know this um, in my mind, logically, sometimes you just you just can't stop yourself as well to to you know um not want to be wrong so it's really an active kind of um it's a conscious decision every time for me to to try to say things even if i know it it might be wrong and i'm still working on it um and um yeah i i think it's it's going to always be a work in progress um to to not always want to be right. Um, I think that's all I can say uh, about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I love that comment. I love that thought because I think sometimes it's good to try and fail, right? Um, yes. And so I just loved your acceptance and kind of your verbalization of it. So I wanted to just say thank you from all of us. We've gotten such great comments. The console is lit up. Uh, very much appreciate your time. Very much appreciate the thought that you put into this talk. And uh, we look forward to watching you and seeing your success as you continue. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. All right, everyone, to hit the red button in the left hand corner of your screen for the next talk. Thank you again, Cassandra.